So good to be back today. Uh, the trip to the lectures at Harding University was a great time of uh, spiritual refreshment and uh, seeing old friends, uh, some really old friends, uh, enjoying uh, learning things that uh, I had not known and being reminded of things that I had. And uh, of course, uh, having uh, being able to make the trip back with Carl and Gwen was a blessing. I'm sorry Carl can't be here with us uh, today, but uh, it's great to have them here in our midst, and I'm so glad that Gwen could be with us this morning. We're starting a new series this morning, studying the letter of First Peter, and the theme is Healthy Christian Living in a Toxic World. In John 16, 33, Jesus said, In the world you have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. He said that because he knew that he was leaving his men behind in a world that uh, was going to become increasingly hostile to them and to their message about him. In fact, he had said, if they hated me, they will hate you. He didn't say that might happen. He said, that's what's going to happen. They've hated me. They will hate you. And he was right. History tells us that all the apostles suffered a martyr's death except for one and many other believers along with them died for their faith simply because they loved and followed Jesus Christ. I think most of us have always felt ourselves kind of far removed from them in that respect, haven't we? We haven't felt the threat of death. Most of us have not been uh, directly persecuted, at least not physically. We haven't been jailed. We haven't been beaten for our faith and things of that nature. But our society, which at one time was basically friendly to our faith, isn't anymore. Some of you do not remember a time when it was friendly, but some of us do. Remember a time when the culture in which we live not only protected our faith, but in some senses even promoted it. But that time's over. It's gone. And now we live in what's been described as a post-Christian age. And we're living in a world that is becoming ever more toxic as far as faith is concerned. It's not, it's not just a world that doesn't care about faith. It's a world that hates faith. It's a world that despises what we believe and despises the one in whom we believe. And we're living in a time when we uh, find that our faith actually disadvantages us because of what we believe and what we teach in many settings. We all know that it's not getting any better. We all know that it isn't likely to get better soon. So we're faced with a big challenge. What do we do? How do we go about living in this toxic world? How do we practice healthy Christian living in a toxic world? Because there's some unhealthy ways that we can react, and we don't want to react in those ways. We want to react in ways that are healthy, in ways that honor God, in ways that reflect the purposes for which he has placed us in this world. We want to stay healthy and strong, and yet we're breathing an atmosphere that is poisonous to our faith. So what do we do, and how do we do it? Well, that's exactly the situation addressed in the letter of First Peter. It's important to remember, first of all, who it is who's writing this letter. If you look at chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And we know him. This is Peter, the fisherman who became a follower of Jesus, who was often brash, who sometimes seemed to speak before he thought, but who loved Jesus with all of his heart, loved him deeply, and who eventually died for his faith. But he's also an apostle of Jesus Christ, and that tells us something important about him, and he's telling his first readers as well as us something important about himself. You see, the word apostle was a common term in the first century world. It didn't necessarily mean a religious figure or a religious emissary, but it, it meant a messenger, but not just any messenger. It meant a messenger who was sent with the, the authority of the one who sent him. And so being an apostle of Christ meant that Peter was a messenger of Christ and that he bore the authority of Christ. He was Jesus' agent he is his commissioned representative in the world. Now, the people who first received Peter's letter surely already knew that he was an apostle, didn't they? So why does he tell them this at the outset of the letter? Why mention it? 
It'd be like writing a letter to a relative and saying, you know, that I'm your cousin, you know, or I'm, I'm your uncle, or I'm your aunt, something of that nature. You think, I already know that. Why does he mention it here? It's because he's making a point. He's making a point about his authority. Since he has authority to speak on behalf of Christ, they need to listen to what he has to say. And that's why 1 Peter is a part of Scripture. This is like the prophets in the Old Testament. You remember how they would say, this is what the Lord says, or thus says the Lord. And then they would state the words of the Lord. And it was an authoritative word. It was a powerful word. It was a word that had to be listened to. And so what Peter is writing is not the word of Peter. We call this the letter of 1 Peter, but it's part of the word of God. It's an inspired, authoritative representative of Jesus himself. And it's telling us things that we need to hear. So the great thing is when we hear Peter telling these first century believers how to live healthy Christian lives in a toxic world, it's God speaking. And it's God telling us how to live healthy Christian lives in a toxic world. These are not hints. They're not suggestions. They're not uh, indications of things that we might think about doing. These are commands of the all-powerful God who created us. These are coming to us as a part of his word, and we need to hear them that way. We need to read this letter, and we need to understand that God is speaking to us about the very subject, the very problem with which we are faced. How do you live a healthy Christian life in a toxic world? So who's he writing this letter to? And I know that's not good grammar. It just sounds better. <laughs> who's he writing this letter to? First of all, it's important to note this. He writes to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion. In Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, if you were to look on a map of the world of the first century in Paul's day, you would find that Pontus, Asia, Cappadocia, Asia, uh, Bithynia, and Galatia were all provinces of what is now known as Turkey. So they're all right there in that same part uh, of that near Middle Eastern part of the world. And so he's addressing the elect exiles who live in that area. Now, elect exile seems like kind of a strange title, doesn't it? We understand exile, but how in the world can an exile be elect? I don't think exiles ever feel elect. I know the, the folks that we've talked to from Ukraine who have had to flee their country, they don't feel like they're elect. They don't feel like they're privileged to be exiles in some sense. So what's Peter getting at when he calls them the elect exiles? Notice he calls them the elect exiles of the dispersion. Now, the dispersion was a way of speaking of the scattered Israelites who had been dispersed among the nations after they were captured and conquered, by, first of all, by the Assyrians in 721 B.C. and later by the Babylonians in 586 B.C. And they became known as the dispersed because the dispersion because what happened was these conquering nations would take all of the people, all the leaders, all the people they thought were capable out of that land and they would deport them and they would either take some of them back to their own land, the ones they thought were useful to them, people who they thought had good useful skills, it would be helpful to them, they'd take to their homeland. Others they would just send to other lands they had conquered and so you had this constant shifting and mixing of peoples and scattering of populations and it was deliberate. It was deliberate because it helped to uh, break the spirit of nationalism of all those nations. Nobody, nobody felt like they were at home, and nobody was together, and, and nobody was left behind who could create uh, an uprising, an insurrection, and, and lead any kind of rebellion. They made sure of that. So they were scattered. They were dispersed, exiles. And people such as Daniel and Nehemiah lived most of their lives as exiles in a foreign land, along with many others. So they were God's elect people, even though they were exiles. They're still God's people. 
They are the dispersed people among the nations, but they still belong to God. They may not be where they want to be or where God eventually will have them to be, but they are still God's people. So Peter borrows that imagery to describe Christian believers in a wide area of the Roman Empire in the first century A.D., and he applies this language to them. And verse 1 isn't the only place that he does so. It's not the only place he calls them that. Look down at chapter 1 and verse 17. You heard it read a few minutes ago when Peter says, Conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. <coughs> Conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Then in chapter 2 and verse 11, he says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. While you are a sojourner, while you are an exile in a land not your own, he says, abstain from the passions that are going to wage war against your soul. In other words, live a healthy life. Live a healthy spiritual life. Chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourself in the same way of thinking. For whomever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but by the will of God. So we live for a time in the flesh. We are exiled in the flesh. This isn't our home. Now, we get why Scripture would refer to Israelites as aliens and exiles, but why Christians? Because just like them, we're not at home. We're away from our real home. We live here temporarily, and we know that. And in our better moments, we're glad that it's only temporary. When Paul was writing to the church in Philippi in chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, he talked about those who had their minds set on earthly things. Their God is the belly. Their minds are set on earthly things, he said. But then he said, but... Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, Christ Jesus, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. That's how Paul saw life in the flesh, that we're waiting. This isn't our home. Our citizenship is really in heaven, and from there we're awaiting this Savior to come and not, not only wash away our sins, he's already done that, but to take him to be with himself and to change our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. That's who we are. In Hebrews 13, in verse 14, after urging believers to go to Jesus outside the camp, that's where he suffered, he said. He was taken outside the camp. He was exiled from the, from the rest of the people. And he was killed there brutally, and he says, let's go out to him. In other words, let's share suffering with him. And after saying, let's go out to him, uh, he says, for, there, for here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. We don't have a lasting city here. We just don't. It's going away. But we seek a city that is to come. You see, while we're here, while we're exiled, we have what all exiles have. Doesn't matter where in the world they are or why they're exiled, all exiles have the same thing. And that's minority status. Minority status. Exiles never feel dominant. Exiles never feel like we're in the majority because they're not. And you and I are not in the majority in this world. I know, listen, folks, there are people who talk about Christians rising up and taking over the world. It isn't going to happen. Read your Bible. It isn't going to happen. We're always going to be a minority. We're going to be a minority of faith. That's what we've been called to do. And so don't look for a time when we'll uh, be ruling the world. Look for a time when Christ will rule the world, but not for a time when we will. We will always have minority status. And as minority status, then, we never quite fit in. We never want to. We don't want to. Malcolm Muggeridge, the 20th century British journalist, once said that the truly religious person is the one who has never 
quite learned to feel at home in this world. Never quite learned to feel at home in this world. The one who always knows there's something else, I'm going somewhere else, I'm not where I want to be, and I'm not where I'm going to be. Muggeridge also quotes Teresa of Avila, who said, life in this world is like a night in a second-class hotel. When I read that statement, I, I thought about a time several years ago when I was invited to, to do some lectures at a, a university in, in Rivna in Ukraine, and my host had said, we'll provide you a place to stay. And I thought, well, that's, that's nice. That's great. And, and it was. It was so gracious of them. The, the, the place that I stayed, though, was a dormitory. And there was a wing of the first floor that was for uh, faculty and visiting guests. And the only thing was, I was the only person on it. And my room was all the way down at the end of the hall. So it was kind of, it was a little spooky, you know, going in there at night and you go all the way down to the end of the hall. No, you're the only person on, on this whole hall and you're the only one in the building who doesn't speak the language, you know. Uh, and, and it was an interesting setup. I had everything I needed. They made sure of that. Had everything I needed. Uh, there was a bed in there, but this bed was that high off the floor. It was that high off the floor. Now, getting down on it wasn't a problem. Okay, I'll leave the rest to your imagination. But it, it was that high off the floor. Uh, there was a huge bathroom with a great big tub, but I couldn't regulate the water. Uh, it, at one moment, it was ice water, and the next second, it was scalding. I mean, it, there was just no, I don't know, somehow it just didn't mix, and so it was from one or the other, and you had to, you had to pick your poison on that. And so there was a communal bathroom across the hall that had a shower that didn't have that problem. So, so I would go across the hall, you know, to the communal bathroom. I had a little refrigerator and, you know, some things to drink and eat in there. And so I had everything I needed for life. But the rest of our group was in Jatomir. They were coming over after about three days. And I told my host, I said, you know, they're going to be living at the Hotel Mirror, so I need to go to the hotel with them and get things set up there. Now, it, those of you who've been to the Hotel Mirror, it's not a great hotel, but I thought it was heaven. <laughs> I was so glad to get there. You know, I really was. I, I'll never forget that. And as I look back on it, as I've been at that hotel since, I thought, this is what I was excited about. But yes, it was the contrast between where I'd been and, and where I ended up. And as I think about that, I think if, if you can feel that way about spending a few nights having everything you need, but just not being as comfortable as you want to be. If you, if you can feel that way about that and then moving to a, a better room, okay, uh, with a better shower and that kind of thing, imagine what it's like. Think about what it's like to go from this life to eternal life. Think what it's like to go from this life to heaven, to the presence of God Think about what it's like to go from this life to what's described in Revelation 21, a place where there is no night there and where the, 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 the lamb gives the light. Jesus the lamb is the light of the city and where there's no mourning and no crying and no death and no pain anymore because the former things have all passed away. Think how that will be. Think how that will be. That's what we have waiting for us. That's what we have waiting for us. And so we never quite should learn to feel at home in this world because in this world we are strangers. We are just passing through. We're just passing through, and we're longing for home. Now, the life of an exile is not an easy one, and it's not supposed to be because this world's standards are not our standards, and its values are not our values, and its rulers ultimately are not our rulers. We're seeking something better. But I want you to notice how Peter describes Christian exiles in verse 2. He says, first of all, we are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Our alien status in this world was no surprise to God. He knew that's how it was going to be in this world. That's what Jesus was telling the disciples. In this world, you will have tribulation. 
And God knew that it was never going to be easy for us to live uh, the lives that we need to live in this world. He saw it coming. And that's why he provide, provides resources for us. And we're going to talk about those next Sunday, about the resources that God has provided. That's the rest of chapter 1. What has he given to exiles to equip us to live in this world? But we never have to wonder who's in control. We never have to wonder, does God know? He knows we're here, and he knows what we're going through. He knows what this life is like, and he is in control of it. Did you know that nothing ever surprises God? I want you to think about that for a minute. Nothing ever surprises God. We were all surprised when we, when we had a COVID pandemic. God wasn't. He knew that was coming. Uh, God knew inflation was coming. God knew the war in Ukraine was coming. God knew that all the world's immorality was coming. And he prepared for it. And he's prepared us for it. We are elect exiles according to the foreknowledge of God. Now, don't get this confused. Foreknowledge is not causing all right? For knowing and causing are two different things. Some folks get that mixed up. They think if God foreknows something, that means he causes it. No, it doesn't. God foreknew that the people of Israel were going to be unfaithful to him in the wilderness. He didn't make them be that way. He gave them a law to live by, and he said, here's the, the way to follow a, a life that will lead you to blessing. But he knew they weren't going to do it, but did he make them do it? No, he didn't make them do it. Foreknowing is not the same as causing. But God foreknew our exile status. He knew that this is the only way that it could possibly be. So we are exiles according to the foreknowledge of God. That tells us things are not out of control. God does know what's going on. We never have to wonder about that. We never have to wonder about that a moment in our lives. The second thing he says is that we are elect in or because of the sanctification of the Spirit. Now, sanctification is one of those words we don't use a lot anymore. We probably should. We should talk about it more than we do. Sanctify, sanctification means that we are God's set-apart people. We have been set apart by the Holy Spirit for the service of God. That's what makes us different from the world because we have God's Spirit within us. Now, remember that there are two phases to sanctification. It's important to know this. There's two phases to sanctification. When you confessed your faith in Christ and were baptized to him, in him, God's Spirit came to live in you. You were sanctified by that. Paul refers to that in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10, when he talks about the ungodly way that some of the, his readers formerly lived. But he says, but you were washed, you were justified, you were sanctified. All right? You were, past tense, sanctified. So when you were baptized into Christ, you were sanctified by the Holy Spirit. But God wasn't finished with you at that point because now there is the maturing phase of sanctification. And that is the Spirit working within us to change us into the likeness of Christ. That's helping us to grow into what we already are. What does that mean? Well, think about a baby. Think about an infant. That infant's already fully human. It's already fully person. But it's not going to stay that way. It's going to grow. It's going to mature. It's going to become something else. It's going to develop abilities and skills and talents and, and all kinds of things. And, it's like, and that's the way you and I are as Christians. We are to grow. We are to mature. We are to become more than what we are now. And that happens because of the work of the Holy Spirit within us. And just as the Holy Spirit is at work within us uh, and is uh, sanctifying each and every one of us. He works in us to help us grow into the likeness of Christ. He works in us to help us mature spiritually. So something's supposed to be happening to us while we're exiled. And that is not that we sit in exile and we just kind of, you know, look around angrily because we're in exile and, and angry at the world around us and we just waste away. We're supposed to develop. We're supposed to grow we're supposed to flower even though we are exiles because we are sanctified in the Holy Spirit of God. Even 
in a toxic world. That testifies to the power of God and the power of his spirit that you and I can be who and what we need to be even though we're living in a toxic world. We can still live those healthy Christian lives. But then the third thing that Peter says is we are elect for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. We were chosen not just to be something, but to do something. And the something is to be obedient to Christ. Now, notice that he says, we were sprinkled with his blood. What's that talking about? That's alluding back to the Old Testament practice when the priest would offer the sacrificial animal and take some of the blood. And on the Day of Atonement, they would go in and they'd put some of that blood even on the uh, Ark of the Covenant itself. They would sanctify the holy place. They would put some on the tent of meeting. But then they would put some on themselves. But then they would fling that blood out over the people and sprinkle them with that blood. Why? Because God had said that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. This is a cleansing blood. And that was a cleansing ritual they were going through. And in the same way, Peter says, we are sprinkled with, we are purified by the blood of Jesus. We're a cleansed people because we are in Christ. That's not true of the rest of the world. You know, we sit back sometimes and we see the headlines and we hear the, the, the awful stuff on the news. Uh, Linda and I had the TV on. We went to bed last night and the news was on and, and it was so awful. She, I can't listen to that anymore and turned it off. It, it's so awful. Why is it that way? Because people aren't cleansed. They're not purified. They're not, and they're not seeking to be. And so the world in which we live is becoming more and more toxic because it's not a cleansed world. And you and I have the, the wonderful privilege of being sprinkled with the blood of Christ. Now, the rest of the world can be, but sadly, the rest of the world isn't. But you see, this is what our lives are supposed to be about that we've been sprinkled with the blood of Christ as we live these obedient lives to Jesus. That's our occupation, being obedient to Jesus Christ. You remember that parable that he told at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, gave all those teachings on the Sermon on the Mount, and then he said, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rains came and the winds blew and the floods beat against that house and it fell because it was not founded on the rock. But the person, he says, who hears these words of mine and does them is like the person who builds a house on the rock, builds it on a foundation. Nothing can knock it down. When you and I are faithful to Jesus Christ in this world, nothing can knock us down or it can hurt us. It can batter us, it can bruise us, but it cannot knock us down. Notice in Peter's statement in verse 2 that all three persons of the Godhead are included in equipping us to live in this world. God the Father foreknew our salvation and our exile status. The Holy Spirit sanctifies us, and we may be exiles, but we are cleansed by the blood of Jesus. But we have it made because we're in touch with our Creator and our Lord all working on our behalf. All working on our behalf. Now, I want to close with this question. Why would Peter begin his letter by reminding his readers, including all of us, of our exile status? Because if you're going to live a healthy life in this world, first of all, you've got to know who you are. And you've got to know whose you are. Because when you don't know who you are, you don't know that you're in exile in this world to live a different life, then the tendency is to become more and more at home in this world and more and more like it. And that's deadly. If we don't know who we are, there's no way we can lead healthy Christian lives in a toxic world. We have to know who we are. We have to know that we are on our way to something that God has provided that's much better.
So where are you most comfortable? Do you feel most at home in this world? Or do you long for the next? I think we'd have to all confess that there is a, a part of us that loves this world. There's a part of us that wants to stay here because there are things about this world that are good. It's God's world. He made it. There are things about this world that we love. But here's the thing. We have to love God more. We have to love God more and we have to trust more that the home that he has prepared for us is better than the one that we're in now so that we become less and less in love with this world and more and more in love with the one who saved us. This world is not our home. We are just passing through. Don't ever forget that, that you're really in exile of God. You are on your way home. If you're in Jesus, but if you're not in Jesus, this is the best there is. If you're not in Christ, and so the biggest question today is, when are you going to begin to follow Jesus? When are you going to obey him? When are you going to confess him as God's son and turn away from sin and be baptized into his death? And let God's spirit sanctify you today and every day of your life until you stand in the presence of God around his throne. I hope and pray that that day is today. And if it is for you, come now and tell us. Let's stand together and sing. There is a habit.